Hello everyone and welcome back. Now, two videos ago I derived the heat equation for you, at least in one spatial dimension, so for a 1D rod. Last video I showed you boundary conditions. Now let's start actually looking at some solutions to this equation. Now, remember I sh have really tried to emphasize here that you should treat this in some ways like it is a partial differential equation. And on top of that, you should treat it as a dynamical system. So two different perspectives in some sense, but what I want to do with this lecture series is really show that they are kind of the same perspective, at least for the types of equations I want to look at in this lecture series. So here what I would like to do is work with a very simple version of the heat equation, right? This is sometimes called the diffusion equation. Again, if you go back to my math modeling lecture, on diffusion, you'll see basically this simple, simple equation, okay? What I would like to do, I want to treat it like a dynamical system. And so the first thing I do when I look at dynamical systems is I look for equilibria, right? Fixed points. Now, what is a equilibrium solution? Well, an equilibrium, in this case, an equilibrium temperature, that's something that doesn't change in time. So it is a solution to the equation that is independent of time. Now, saying it's independent of time does not mean it's constant, right? That was something that we saw in dynamical systems or ordinary differential equations. But that's because there is only one independent variable. Here now, I get just a function of x, right? So I have an ordinary differential equation to solve. On top of this, you can see that I have not properly formulated my problem because when you present a partial differential equation, you have to also give boundary conditions, right? So I need to know what happens at the endpoints because this could be very different depending on what's happening on these endpoints, right? Imagine your rod. Uh, you, and think about some of the examples for boundary conditions that we looked at in the previous video, right? You could be pumping in heat from the left-hand side, right? That would be a very different solution than if the rod was just sitting doing nothing in your garage for six years, right? So let's take a look at what some of the different boundary conditions do. Let's look at prescribed, prescribed boundary conditions first. Okay, so here's my, here's my prescribed boundary conditions. I'm going to assume that the left side of the rod is fixed to temperature T1, which I'm going to assume is constant, and the right side of the rod is fixed to temperature T2, which again I'm going to assume is constant. Okay, now I have a properly formulated what's called boundary value problem. I know I've got an ordinary differential equation between 0 and L in X, and now I know what happens at the endpoints of that thing. So let's solve this thing. Okay, so I've got this. Clearly, I hope that you can probably do this yourself, but essentially this gives me a linear equation, right? It gives me C1x plus C2. You notice that I have two constants. I have, it's a second order equation. I needed two conditions in order to specify a unique solution. Again, this is where our knowledge of ordinary differential equations comes in, right? So I'm gonna take a lot of this for granted, assume that you kind of have some basic grasp on understanding and solving ordinary differential equations so that we can move forward into these partial differential equations. So after you apply the boundary conditions here, you get a specific solution which no longer depends on T, it's the equilibrium temperature, which is going to be T1 plus T2 minus T1 over L times X. Okay, so it's just a constant solution that stretches across the rod from T1 at the left point to T2 at the right point. Nothing too fancy. Now, let's think, let's use a little bit of our intuition about heat flow, right? So if I, you know, start heating up, uh, you know, if I start a little bonfire right here in the middle of the room, what's it gonna do? 
Well, it's going to heat the rest of the room, right? That heat is going to spread and it's going to raise the average temperature of the entire room. Now, if that bonfire remains at a constant heat, it's going to sort of bring the entire average of the room up and it's going to settle into a very, very warm room. If there's nothing else external applied to this, that's all that happens. Again, remember I told you that this equation can also describe chemical pollutants. So imagine I dump a bunch of chemical pollutants into a pond, which is something I would never do. Um, what would happen? Well, eventually those pollutants mix and eventually they sort of get this sort of uniform distribution over the pond, right? So the idea here is that if I take a cup of water from one side of the pond and you take a cup of water from the other, you know, if we waited long enough, they're going to have the same distribution of chemical pollutants in them. This diffusion equation, this heat equation, everything seems to sort of settle out into an equilibrium. Well, if everything settles down into an equilibrium and we found that there's only one equilibrium here, then we can at least use a little bit of our intuition to find or to expect that every solution to the heat equation, at least with these boundary conditions, approaches the equilibrium solution, right? So essentially what this is saying you know, I, I didn't prove it. We'll see it whenever we start solving these equations. But for now, I think you can probably trust me that sort of no matter what happened in the rod initially, that's going to sort of peter out. And it's really just the heat being pumped in from the endpoints that's going to sort of fix this solution, right? Everybody's going to sort of even out until I get this nice even distribution. Okay. Then what happens with other boundary conditions? Let's look at insulated. So insulated boundary conditions. Now remember, these are the boundary conditions that take place in terms of the derivative, okay? So let's look at this one. Remember, this is my, uh, my swimming pool example. So here I'm going to have Neumann boundary conditions. And essentially what it says is that heat can't be lost to the boundaries, both sides, right? So again, if you've got your big splashing pool, the amount of water is never, it never changes, right? It might move around. There might be more water over here I mean, when I do a cannonball here, but it, the, the amount of water in the, in the pool never gets lost to the sides, okay? There's no splashing, essentially. Same thing here. Heat never runs off the edges. It's perfectly insulated on the, other, on the ends of this thing, so I never lose any heat. Okay, so now I can solve my partial differential equation again. So again, I get the exact same thing that I had before. What, what was it? C1x plus C2, that's not that interesting. The only interesting thing is that C1 and C2 are determined by my boundary conditions. But now, my boundary conditions, they give infinitely many equilibrium solutions, right? There's a different equilibrium solution for each constant value across the rod. Okay, so that's very strange, right? Because, okay, based on my little intuition here, we expect... Well, what do we expect? We kind of expect that the temperature settles into this one of these equilibrium distributions. We just don't know which one, right? So, but which one? Now, again, if you want to use my swimming pool example, this actually might be a pretty good example. So I've got no water being lost on the sides of my swimming pool. I do a cannonball and the water goes all crazy. But what happens after a long period of time? The water settles down, right? And if I leave, if I get out of the pool and I leave the pool overnight or whatever it is, I come back and the height of the water is just constant all the way across the top. It's constant, right? Same thing, my, my chemical pollutant being leaked into the lake, right? What happens? 
Well, there's no pollutant being lost to any of the boundaries, right? Because it can't go anywhere but the lake. And so therefore, you know, as time goes on, the concentration of the chemical pollutant becomes constant everywhere in space. Same basic principles. So the question is, what is it that it's getting, what constant is being chosen here? Well, I want to show you something uh, really strange or really kind of cool. And you might have a guess at this. If you do have a guess, see if you're right, right? I'd love to know if you got this right. Let me know. But, okay, let's say, um, let's say let u of x and t be a solution to the heat equation. Okay, so this thing could change in space and time, right? So whatever your initial distribution of heat is, you know, you flow forward according to these boundary conditions. Uh, I haven't told you if solutions exist or not, but I'm going to tell you, you know, solutions exist. They are unique. You have these sort of standard existence uniqueness things for these. Uh, let's look at, let's look at, I want to look at the average over space as a function of time. Okay. So basically, you know, I want to look at you know, this is, this is sort of one way of looking or measuring this rod, right? I could say, what's the average of the temperature across the entire rod, right? For each point in time. This kind of makes sense, right? So you might, you know, vary very wildly, but I could ask myself, you know, a, a, as a, a sort of way of just, you know, getting a simple real number out of this thing, I could just say, just tell me the average of the rod at every point in time. It's much easier for me to interpret. I don't really care about the spatial dependencies. Well, here's something. So then I would like to know how this cha thing changes in time, right? I can ask for what's the, this is a function of time. I can take a derivative in time. So let's take that derivative. One over L, zero to L. And again, I'm doing this because I know it works, right? I don't expect you to sort of come up with this on your own. It's a very complicated thing to come up with, uh, but it's still, it's, you know, it's worth looking at. Okay, so I'm going to take this derivative inside the integral, right? I'm integrating in space, so I can do that. So now I get ul zero to l of the partial derivative of u with respect to t integrated with respect to x. But now I know this thing is a, a solution to the heat equation. That means that its time derivative is equal to its second space derivative times k. So now I get k over l, integral from 0 to l, x squared, ux of t dx. Now I'm, I'm taking the integral of a derivative, right? This is a fundamental theorem of calculus application. So here I get k over l, and now I get the first derivative and I'm evaluating it at each of the endpoints, zero and L. But my Neumann boundary conditions told me that it's zero at each endpoint. And so this thing is equal to zero. Okay, that's, uh, is, is there anything sort of interesting here yet? I certainly think so, because this tells me that the average temperature is constant for all time. The average temperature of the rod, if I, you know, if I get bored, I say, I don't really care about what happens in space, just tell me the average temperature. The average temperature never changes, right? This is, this is like a concert. I mean, this is literally a conservation law, right? But this is, uh, this is showing you that the sort of heat energy is never lost or never produced, right? It is the same all the time. And so in particular, if you started with some distribution of heat energy, which again, that's my initial condition, f of x, this tells me that uh, the average of my temperature sorry, is just equal to the average of the initial distribution. 
So, right? So whatever the distribution of this is, the average is maintained for all time, which means that this quantity, if you want to tell me what the average temperature of the rod is, it's just whatever the average temperature I started with is, which also tells me that now I'm just taking the limit of a constant function. So here, the, the limiting average is just the average of what you started with. Okay, so a lot of the word average over and over again. So do we, can we follow this? Well, let's use my pool, my chemical pollutant example, right? The amount of chemical pollutant is preserved, right? Even though initially I dump it in at one endpoint, if I look at the amount of, or the average amount of chemical pollutant across the entire uh, pond, that's this thing when we start. And all that happens is the chemical pollutant spreads, but the average remains the same. And in particular, that thing is eventually going to iron itself out so it becomes uniform across space so that everywhere in the pond, the chemical pollutant is on average the same. Same thing with heat flow, right? So if initially there's some sort of spike of heat at the middle of the rod, maybe I heated it way up. If I stop heating it, what happens? The temperatures just even out. They completely average out. So if it was massively hot in the middle and cold on the, out, on the outsides, whatever the average of that initial distribution of the heat is, it's all just going to sort of average out so that it becomes uniform across the rod. That's what this is telling you. Okay, same thing with my pool. I jumped in, I did a cannonball, I got out, it's all wavy. Well, whatever the average of the height of that water is, that's what it's gonna settle into, okay? So if there's a lot of water here and not a lot of water here, eventually it's gonna come down and be completely even out, okay? So even though there's infinitely many equilibrium temperatures, only one can be selected, and it is selected by how you start, right? That's all that this is saying. Okay, so those are two examples of solving for equilibrium temperatures. You can put in different boundary conditions and you can find different types of solutions. What you should really try to do is maybe take an example of Newton's law of cooling. You know, sort of combine these two things and, and do Newton's law of cooling and see what the equilibrium temperature tells you and try and figure out, you know, physically what that means for the heat equation. Or if you'd like, if it helps you make a little more sense, use my chemical pollutant example or my, my swimming pool example, right? Try and think about these things um, in terms of the, the, what they physically represent instead of just what they mathematically represent. Okay, in the next video, I'm going to show you the heat equation in multiple space dimensions. So for example, if you have a sheet that is being heated up, or if you have a disc that is being heated up, or if you have some sort of three-dimensional sphere that is being heated up, we can all describe these things with a class of equations, which we just still just call the heat equation. So I'll see you all in the next video, everybody.